protect your DNA. BioPQQ can promote formation of new mitochondria. InfoWarsStore.com Today, Sheriff Arpaio said he is going to continue to investigate the birth certificate of Barack Obama. He said, I'm not going to give up. He said, I don't care where he's from. It is a forged document, period. Folks, Obama came in with a deception. We didn't know who this guy was. He was lying about uh, so many things. He had a hidden agenda. Today, we're going to take a look at Obama as he leaves. He laid out his legacy, his last eight years before the UN today, and we're going to look at it. It's got a lot of layers, just like his birth certificate. <laughs> we're going to see what he has forged these last eight years. Now, today he went before the UN. He told the group, he says, uh, as I address you for the final time as president, I'm sure he will be back in some capacity at the UN because he's already had another capacity that he held simultaneously with being the president. One of the interesting things he had, he said, we're going to look at the progress that we've made these last eight years. And when he says we, he means the globalist government because this entire speech is from the perspective of a globalist. Some of his accomplishments, he says, we've taken away terrorist safe havens and we have resolved the Iranian nuclear issue. Seriously, we have taken away terrorist safe havens. He has set the Middle East on fire. He has created a terrorist arms bazaar in Libya, deposing a regime that posed no threat to us or anyone else. And then he has resolved the Iranian nuclear issue. No, he has revived the Iranian nuclear issue with a massive money laundering scheme. Uh, billions, actually uh, billions sent in cash on a secret plane, foreign currency that he brought in. But let's look at what else he has to say, because the next thing that he goes to, I think, is very telling. He says, we've made international institutions like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund more representative. He doesn't support that. But do you really believe that the IMF is more representative? We've had the IMF now holding a gun to the head of Greece, demanding that they change their government. And we've seen in the last eight years the IMF and other institutions deposing democratically elected representatives in Greece and Italy, putting in bankers in their place. But I think it's very interesting that he takes the World Bank and the IMF, two of the key instruments of the globalist multinational fascists that are taking over democracies, and he uses them in the same juxtaposition saying, while we establish a framework to protect our planet from the ravages of climate change. You see, that is the model for what they're going to do with climate change. They're going to have these non-controllable, non-democratic institutions like the IMF and the World Bank that are going to literally be banks for the multinational corporatists who wrote the Trans-Pacific, the Transatlantic Treaties, who wrote the Climate Change Treaty. Those are the pillars for world government. The Climate Change Treaty is how they are going to establish the authority and the funding for world government. And we'll see that further on in his speech. He says, we're seeing the same forces of global integration that have made us interdependent also expose deep fault lines in the existing international order. Yes, we have seen the European Union talk about this, the president of the European Union, just talk about galloping nationalism and how it presents an existential threat to the European Union. They know that people are waking up. They know that we see what they're doing. The question is, will we act collectively to stop this takeover? They say, he says, refugees are flowing across the border. Here's some of the problems that you all understand, and they're going to uh, enumerate these problems so that you think that they're with you, that they see them as problems. They don't see them as problems. They see them as tools to do what they want, which is to further consolidate the global government. He says, refugees flow across borders. Financial disruptions continue to weigh upon our workers and entire communities. Across vast swaths of the Middle East, basic security, basic order has broken down. All these things are true, but that's by their design. He says, we see too many governments muzzling journalists. Oh, you mean like Barack Obama has done with the 1917 Espionage Act? Prosecuting more journalists in his term, as a matter of fact, three times more people, whistleblowers and journalists, than all the other presidents in the previous 100 years combined. That's precisely what he's been doing. Quashing dissent, he says. That's precisely what he's been doing. Censoring the flow of information, which is what they are attempting to do with control of the Internet. 
And then he goes on to make a very interesting statement. Powerful nations contest the constraints placed on them by international law. That says everything. So we are chafing under the tyranny of an international law, an international law that you have absolutely no control over. You don't have any democratic representation in this international law any more than you have any democratic representation in these treaties that are going to control our economies. That is the fundamental issue before us. He says, but nevertheless, we must go forward into more globalism and not backwards. He says, we need to integrate our global economy because it has made life better for billions of men and women and children over the last 25 years. And he goes on to put out a uh, statistic that I don't believe is true. He doesn't support it. We're going to fact check some of the statistics. We're not going to fact check this one. He says, over the last 25 years, people living in extreme poverty have been cut from nearly 40% of humanity to under 10% of humanity, okay? I think that figure is just as phony as the unemployment figure that he gives for the U.S. economy. That one is very easy to fact check. And what he is telling us here is that even though he goes to Africa and tells the people there, uh, you, you guys can't have air conditioning. I mean, the planet would explode. <laughs> that type of thing. That's his compassion for the people in developing countries. He goes on to say, cracking the genetic code promises to cure diseases that have plagued us for centuries. That might be a little bit troubling. But let's go on with the economics that he says and the, politi uh, the politics that he says. In remote corners of the world, Obama says, citizens are demanding respect for the dignity of all people, no matter their gender, race, religion, disability, sexual orientation, and those who deny others dignity are subject to public reproach. That essentially is the legacy of the Obama administration as we see today. The Navy becoming the center for transgender promotion within the military. And that is what he has focused on because that has become an instrument of division within the communities. He goes on to talk about the end of the Cold War has lifted the shadow of nuclear Armageddon, yet they have put this back on. They have revived the Cold War under Obama, and yet he talks about the Cold War as if it were ended. He goes on to say China and India remain on a path of remarkable growth, but the bottom line is not America, folks, not America. He says to move forward, we have to acknowledge that the existing path to global integration, see, that's the key. They want global integration. He says in this document over and over again, he refers to global integration, global governance, and it is global governance by an unelected elite, even though he spends a great deal of time talking about democracy. He says it may require course correction. Those trumpeting the benefits of globalization have ignored the inequality within and among nations. He says we've left international institutions ill-equipped, underfunded, under-resourced in order to handle transnational challenges. Now, what are the problems, he says? The global problems are that the U.S. is still richer than other nations. That's what he just said. He said, we have ignored the inequality between nations. You understand, we're the ones that are going to be taken down to the level of other people. They're not going to be lifted to our level. This is a leveling socialism that they are selling us. We've already seen it for the last 25 years with NAFTA and these other trade agreements. They're going to lower us. They will lift the other countries somewhat, but they will lower us by a massive amount. So that's how they're going to take care of the inequality between nations. And then he said the problem is that they have global institutions that are ill-equipped and underfunded. Where's that money going to come from? It's going to come from us. They're going to tax us. And it's going to be done for transnational challenges. See, he's just talking about his dream of transgenders, even controlling our restrooms. Now, what is really behind this, folks, there's a different kinds of, of tranny that he is selling to keep you distracted from what they're doing at the global level. They're, they're getting us confused with gender. They're trying to control our restrooms, get us fighting amongst each other while they impose a transnational governance. That's what the trans-Pacific, the transatlantic party, they're transcending all national borders. As mm -hmm. the EU official said, borders are the worst invention ever. They believe that. He says, sometimes this opposition is coming from the far left. Sometimes it's coming from the far right. Now, they'll always paint it as extremists, but this is an acknowledgement from Obama that he is being opposed by people on both the left and the right. People on both the left and the right do not, do not like their globalism. He says, we cannot dismiss these visions. They're powerful. They reflect dissatisfaction among too many of our citizens. But he said, we don't want to have a nation that is ringed by walls. It would only imprison itself. 
think about the irony of that. He talks about us imprisoning ourselves if we have a border, if we have some control. And the reality is, is that he has continued to preside over for eight years over a nation that has locked up more of its people than any other nation in history with a drug war. And we can do better. We can have a war on terrorism, too. We can lock up even more people, uh, more political dissidents, more journalists, more whistleblowers. That's the answer to everything in the Obama administration. But you want to talk about prison? You want to talk about controlling the borders, imprisoning people? It is our war on drugs that is imprisoning people. He says, so the simple answer cannot be a rejection of global integration. He said, let me offer some broad strokes that can make these things better. And then he contrasts North Korea with South Korea, talks about the failure of central planning. And yet he he says that so that he can then attack capitalism as being soulless, that it only benefits the few. And here's one of the big lies of this presentation that he has that I want to fact check. He says, these are the policies that I've pursued here in the United States in order uh, uh, democracy and a, and a control over soulless capitalism. He said, American businesses have now created 15 million new jobs. Well, okay. If you look at the unemployment rate, there's an unemployment rate called the U6. And that's what we used to call the unemployment rate until they changed it under Clinton. They discontinued people who have discontinued to become discouraged and not looking for jobs or haven't been able to find a job in a certain period of time. If you're unemployed for a certain period of time, then you basically aren't in the workforce and they're not going to cover you anymore in the statistics, they say. But if you cover the people who can't find jobs, if you cover the people who are underemployed, then you see that the true unemployment rate is nearly 10%. And if he says that we have created 15 million jobs Understand that a lot of those jobs are part-time jobs that are there because of the Obamacare mandates and people trying to escape full-time workers. And then he makes an incredible statement about the top 1% of Americans, capturing more than 90% of income growth. He says, but today that's down to about half. No, that's not true. Take a look at income inequality, inequality.org. They say the United States income equality has been growing markedly by every major statistical measure for some 30 years. And they talk about the fact that it is not only, uh, it has accelerated in the last few years. They say it took a short dive after the troubles in 2007, 2008, but it is now back on course. And they say the biggest consolidations, the biggest inequality is at the top 0.1%. They say inequality in America is growing even at the top. The nation's highest 0.1% of income earners have over recent decades seen their incomes rise much faster than even the rest of the top 1%, increasing by seven and a half times. That is the truth of what is being done to America. Now, I want to jump ahead to what he has to say about Islam. There's a lot of things that we could go over that we don't have time for. He says we must reject any forms of fundamentalism or racism or a belief in ethnic superiority. And yet he talks to us then about his favorite thing, which is Islam. He says, it is a truthism that global integration has led to a collision of cultures, trade, migration, the internet. All these things can challenge and unsettle our most cherished identities. And then he gives examples of what his most cherished identities are. He said, we see liberal societies express opposition when women choose to cover themselves. Hmm, You mean like with a burqa. We see protests responding to Western newspaper cartoons that caricature the prophet Muhammad. Praise be upon him, says Obama. Okay, he goes on to say, suggesting that somehow people who look different are corrupting the character of other countries. No, it's not that they look different. It's that they want a different form of government. That is why they are being brought here. They want to establish a theocracy. This is not about distinguishing between people because of their skin color or because of the way they look. It's about distinguishing between people and saying, we don't want people here who have such a rabid hatred of people who don't share their religion and that they want to impose a religion through the legal system rather than having the kind of liberal democracy, as he would put it, that we've had for centuries. And then he sums it up. He says, across the region's conflicts, that's the Middle East, we have to insist that all parties recognize a common humanity and that nations end proxy wars that fuel disorder. Ah, but he has done both. He has fueled a proxy war and he has created disorder. And he has used that proxy war to bring disorder to the United States. 
And that's precisely what Hillary Clinton wants to continue. This article we have at InfoWarriors.com today, neither Hillary nor Obama condemn Wahhabist terror. Wayne Madsen points out that Clinton wants a 555% increase in Muslim immigration. And of course, that's just what she's saying before the election. And when you push back against this, you push back against the idea that we don't know who the people are that are being brought in. You get an amazing pushback from the left. Criticizing Donald Trump Jr. when he had the meme with the Skittles saying, uh, if I've got a bowl of Skittles and only three of them will kill you, will you still take a handful of that? Well, they came back and they criticized him for saying that. And yet at the same time, the Democrats are eating Skittles for show in the Congress. At the same time, we've got NPR criticizing uh, Donald Trump Jr. for using a meme that he doesn't own the photographic rights to. At the same time, all of that is happening. The State Department itself says that we can't vet these people. And the state of Texas is saying, we know that. That's why we're going to opt out of this in the future. That's the reality, folks. Stay with us. When we come back, we'll look at the riots in Charlotte. In the last 20 years, InfoWars has paid its dues. We have proven that we are a cutting edge news and information source. And when it comes to funding our operations, we take cutting edge to the next level with the highest quality supplements and nutraceuticals available. We have now more than 25 different amazing formulas available at InfoWarsStore.com. And the flagship is Super Male and Super Female Vitality, where we take thousands of years of the ancient knowledge and use high-tech modern technology to cold press these organic herbs to give you compounds that are meant to accentuate the body's normal function. This is essential because the globalists are on record targeting our endocrine system, targeting our hormones to suppress us. But Mother Nature is there to counter this onslaught. Everyone out there watching and listening to me owes it to themselves to give Mother Nature a try and to try Super Male our super female vitality. We're making it easier than ever today with a special we're running for two weeks only. 20% off on these formulas at InfoWarsLife.com or simply call toll free. We can answer all your questions. 888-253-3139. Major third party sites give these formulas the highest rating in their class because we've done the research and we haven't cut corners. 20% off these formulas right now at InfoWarsLife.com or call toll-free 888-253-3139. You have nothing to lose. I know these formulas work. They've worked for me. But regardless, you're supporting the info war in a historic, critical time. I also want to take some time out to thank all of you that have supported InfoWarsStore.com and who have gotten these products. So for myself and the rest of the InfoWars crew, I salute you for being on the side of life in the fight against the globalists.